But we know it's going to happen with microorganisms that thrive in that space that ultimately get into our food chain. Somewhere between LA to San Francisco. And the smell is like the stench is unbearable and they're making gut-wrenching sounds. These are the things that we know reading grounds for these pandemics. They got COVID fourth or fifth time. She's saying, I'm just preparing to die. There's some things that are kind of urgent in terms of health and, and but some are super urgent, it's like, you know, like the next pandemic, for example, which is a certainty. I so asked you, is it a prediction or a plan to the next pandemic? <laughs> <laughs> if it's a plan, whose plan is it, sir? <laughs> and which city is it going to come from? <laughs> it, I mean, those questions don't really matter. I mean, what, what, what matters is that we know what the main risk factors are. I mean, the risk factors are is our agriculture to put more of our animals in ever greater densities um, and to limit the, the, the boundary that we have with, with, a, with, with wild animals in many countries, India and Brazil, and we're moving closer and closer to these habitats and uh, China, obviously. In India, cattle rearing is not a… it's not a big deal. It's, there is no such organized cattle rearing, they're just there. We used to have over a billion or a billion plus uh, cattle about twenty years ago. Today it is numbered around seven and eighty million, something like that. But they're generally there, uh, either in the farmlands or in the forests, wild ones and things like that. I once happened to go into a… you know, I was driving on a highway and I heard some hideous sounds like stomach churning kind of. My stomach is very strong, I can mm. travel in the ocean <laughs> without having a big seasickness. Mm. Wherever I am, I'm not a motion sickness person or anything, I can see anything, I'm kind of made like that. But these sounds are like gut-wrenching kind of sounds. So we were just traveling and we wanted to see what it is we just drove in. Oof. I don't know, somewhere between LA to San Francisco, a little deeper into the uh, plains, and this must be probably one, maybe thirty-four or fifty acres kind of fenced land. I don't know how many animals, I couldn't even guess. It must be definitely somewhere between half a million to one million animals, packed. And the smell is like… the stench is unbearable and they're making gut-wrenching sounds. I don't know if it's a slaughterhouse or something, mm. I couldn't make out, there were some sheds. Oh. It is the worst kind of misery. The first thing that came to me is the movies we have seen, the Holocaust uh, mm -hmm. things. This is just like that and the sounds that are coming out of that place. I think… Uh, I think the diet will change if you make a visit. But th th these are the things that we know are um, breeding grounds for these… for these pandemics, you know, and… Um, microorganisms that… that thrive in that space <clears throat> that ultimately get into, uh, you know, in, uh, in, into our food chain, into our air. I mean, the density of these animals is something, you know, that, that will create, so the microbes will, will uh, rebel against this. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a natural uh, response of, of, of nature to, to this kind of farming. So we know it's going to happen. We know also, for example, recent studies just last week, study has shown that um, this long COVID phenomenon, so, you know, people have persistent symptoms, which is… which is really a major compromise of quality I, of life. I have some uh, letters and uh, appeals saying that they got COVID fourth or fifth time. And recently, one young woman that I've… I knew about three years ago, she came to India and I met her. She's saying, uh, I will not recover, I'm just preparing to die this COVID will not go, this is the fifth time I got it, I'm just deteriorating, I'm going, please help me. So, uh, I don't know if it is getting more complex, the same thing, uh, because the mutations that came up in India were weaker than the first one, so we thought we have beaten it and we are fine, that kind of uh, <laughs> conclusions we came to. See, how we see food is, we see that when we eat something, we must eat that kind of food, which in terms of species is furthest away from us. So, plant life is definitely far away from us. 
If at all, if you must eat non-vegetarian or something which is not of, uh, you know, from plant life, you can eat fish. Fish, that's why we call it as in South India, we call it as jalapushpam. This means uh, it's the flower in the water. Because it behaves like plant life in your mm. body, because it's so further away from your own genetic code. If you eat something which is closer to your genetic code, for example, like mammals, if you eat a mammal which is so close to you, the complexity of that genetic code and its biome and everything doesn't work for us. This is a fundamental thing, that it'll dull your system, it'll… it'll complicate your own genetic codes, it'll get mixed up. And now everybody is talking about epigenetics, I don't know, scientific knowledge, but we know what causes dullness in us, what causes alertness in us, what lowers our perception, what heightens our perception. This is something we are always conscious about. Before we put something, we are always looking in terms of not protein, vitamin like this. We are only thinking in terms of if I consume this, will I become less receptive or more receptive? Mm -hmm. This is the only concern we yeah. have. Because in this life, whether you live for hundred years or fifty years, how receptive you are is how profound your life's experience is. Mm -hmm. So, we are not looking at the length of our experience, but the profoundness of our experience. So, this is the concern. In this concern, we are seeing that what we consume must be far away from us in genetic code. Does this have something to do with biome? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, um, I would say, the best thing that you can do for your health in terms of eating is to eat what your microbes thrive on. And that, that's essentially, it's largely plant-based food, mainly because of the fiber molecules that only the microbes can break down, and these polyphenol molecules and some of the micronutrients. So what you're saying is it's essentially just another, um, you know, like non, a non-scientific uh, version of that same story that it's, it's, we, we have this ancient life form, these microbes have been around for 3.5 billion years on the planet, and they thrive best on the kind of food items oh. that are far away from our own, you know, mammalian uh, evolutionary step. Uh, I've actually never thought about this, and, uh, the, like what you just said, but it, it fits exactly that. Uh, that's great. Yeah.